Yeah. Oh my god. Now step up. Uh, now. I can. Yes, you can, or I'm gonna put you in there. Now get in there. So we're gonna put you back there. We're not doing this no more with you. So quit. We've been medically cleared, so we know that. Well, they say they want you gone, so you got to go. This is their property. You're going to get up, and you're going to sit here. I'm going to stuck you in the floor. Like you were heaven, so I'm going to put you in there. Now, you know what? 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 I don't know if she's faking it or what, but she's not answering me. When your health is at stake and you need emergency medical aid, you go to the hospital. And you trust the expert staff to take care of you because they're highly trained to do so. Most of the time, these types of professionals do their best to find and treat your illness before sending you home. This is the normal practice of the good men and women that work tirelessly in the healthcare field. Normally, they treat patients with fairness, equality, and compassion, all while understanding that a sick person just wants to feel better. True medical professionals and public servants help people and often save their lives in the process. But when 60-year-old Lisa Edwards needed medical attention on February 5th of 2023, her horrifying experience left the public stunned. In 2018, Lisa Edwards moved from Tennessee to Rhode Island so she could be near her family. But she couldn't outrun her love for the Rocky Top State and, ultimately, decided to fly back to Knoxville in early February of 2023. Upon arriving in Tennessee, Lisa was going to be living with a friend. She was excited to get back to the state she loved and had everything planned out to the T. After she boarded her flight, the plane took off without any issues. Everything was going exactly the way Lisa Edwards wanted it to go. However, mid-flight, she began to experience severe and unbearable abdominal pain. As soon as Lisa's plane touched down in Tennessee, she was quickly transported to Blount Memorial Hospital for treatment. But shortly after she was seen, she was discharged. Still certain something wasn't right, Lisa sought further treatment from another hospital called Fort Sanders Regional Medical Center. But they too discharged her on the early morning of February 5th at 6.55, completely disregarding her protests and insistence that she needed medical intervention. Lisa begged anyone who would listen that she needed help. She repeatedly told people she was dying and begged for someone to save her life. Lisa had COPD and required an inhaler. She'd also suffered a stroke in 2019 and couldn't walk. Due to this, Lisa was wheelchair bound. They asked you to leave, didn't they? Did the hospital ask you to leave? No, they said they want you to leave. You gotta leave though, they want you gone. No, they want you gone. Authorities say despite being repeatedly asked and eventually ordered to, Lisa refused to leave the premises. They acted like nothing was wrong with her. She insisted she was having another stroke or even a heart attack, but her cries fell upon deaf or uncaring ears. I know I can't, I can't even get to the door. You can't get where? Huh? You can't get to where? They don't want you back up there. They want you to leave their property. They want you to leave their property, ma'am. Can I what? You got to go somewhere. What?
Well, I don't. Who beat you up? So the people in the hospital beat you up last night. Well, they say they want you gone, so you gotta go. This is their property. Well, I can't even get out of here. You're gonna have to figure something out. Because there ain't no need for you to go to jail over some nonsense, but you gotta leave. I know. I can't get in your truck. No. I can't walk. Oh, why can't you walk? You, your ankle shattered, yes. and they kicked you out. Yes. Go ask them. You must have been giving them some problems then. Huh? Were you giving them problems? Yes, I'm here problems. Why were you giving them problems then? Huh? Why were you giving them problems? I wasn't giving them problems. I'm going to go talk to them. Hold on. Okay. Lisa Edwards, a disabled 60-year-old woman sat in a parking lot outside the hospital, hopelessly unable to think clearly, let alone help herself. And how did she end up in the parking lot, you might ask? Hospital staff willed Lisa out there and left her in the wheelchair, further ignoring her pleas. The staff even called security to force her to leave the hospital grounds. When that didn't work, security called the police to have her trespassed and forcibly removed from the hospital property. This was a 60-year-old handicapped woman a disabled American citizen who did nothing but seek help from the professionals she should have been able to depend on in her time of ultimate crisis. And my wife's like, oh my God, 23 degrees out over again. She looked at the weather report, it's negative 23. Where's where she going? going? Hell far, I know. Lisa was treated like a criminal. What was her crime? What made her so deserving of this treatment? Did she assault someone? Threaten someone's life? Kick a puppy? According to reports, no, Lisa didn't do any of those things. She begged for help at a hospital to save her life. At 7.40 a.m. on Sunday of February 5th, Knoxville police officers attended the scene and ordered the medically distressed grandmother to leave. When Lisa told them she couldn't walk, they further insisted that she vacate the property or else she would be taken to jail. Listen, you're going to have to get up there because we're going to have to physically put you up there if not. 
And that's not as nice. So please help us help you. Oh my God. You've been medically cleared, so let's get in. My foot's wrong. I can't. You're going to break me. Yes, ma'am. You're going to have to get in. My ankle. I can't breathe. Well, you're, you've been medically cleared, ma'am. This is not going to work. So we need you to help us. My Matt, you need to get in there. My See it right there. You weren't having these breathing problems right there when you're out here smoking a cigarette. They seemed to think she was refusing to leave, but the truth is, Lisa couldn't leave. Officers seemed to think Lisa was putting on an act. After all, the hospital had medically cleared her, but apparently no one had mentioned that Lisa was wheelchair-bound, and no one had bothered to call her family or friends to arrange transportation for the helpless woman. What's she looking for? The medicine portion of it. She's in a hell of a, she got 17 packs of cigarettes. Isabella Circle. Yep, you could have gave her a ride. You still live at Isabella? She told us she doesn't live there anymore. No, stop. Okay, it's not working. Okay, just stop. Okay? We're not doing this. So we're going to put you back there. We're not doing this no more with you. So quit. You've been medically cleared, so we know better. My Listen, you're getting in there one way or the other, so stop. You're, you're you're pulling against us. Quit. Now get in. I'm gonna put you in there if you don't help us, ma'am. Now stop this. Okay. Let's turn around. Walk back. Turn around. Oh my god. Walk. Oh my god. Now step up. Now. I can. Yes, you can, or I'm gonna put you in there. Now get in there. I mean. Don't reach on my head. Let me in. Let me in. Let me in. Get in the bag on. Uh, okay. Uh, huh? Oh my uh, Jesus uh, Lord Mary goats. You don't have an inhaler. Well, we can't find it. <laughs> we looked everywhere, we can't find it. Uh, oh my god. Oh my god. I'm here. You do not have an inhaler, but you have six packs of cigarettes, ma'am. I do have money. Ma'am, I'm going to ask you to stand up, and I'm going to ask you to help me one last time. You can stop. I've had enough. Get up. Use your legs. We'll stop. Now you're starting to piss me off. Get up. Oh, my blood. I just did. Okay. Okay, give me up. You have to use your legs and quit. No, you're not. Use your legs. I can't. Yes, no, they're not. They are. Why can't you put me in the back? I can't pick her up because she's dead weight. She's not yeah. using her damn no. legs no, on she purpose. Didn't. She's not That's helping. What she was doing. No, no, no. Uh, you're gonna have to come help me get this woman in this because she's nothing but dead weight. Huh? As soon as we grab hold of her, she goes dead weight. I need more muscle. Oh my god. You talk to him. This is not mine. I'm just trying to help. Yeah. This is all the I can't get her. Listen to me. I'm not I'm not doing this with you, okay? This is the Lord. Listen to me. This is the Lord's day. All I want to do is give me some coffee and some oatmeal. We're not going to deal with your mess this morning. We've already spent too much time on you. You're going to get up here in this van and you're going to go to jail. We're done with this. I'm tired of this dead weight crap. Listen, listen to me. You're going to pick your legs up and you're going to get in here. Step right. 
Okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, no, that's that's the whole problem. I mean, it's not. It's room for yeah. one. You're going to keep my I know. Put your feet up. I'm going to pass out. You're not going to pass out. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? Well, go and get in there and pass out. We'll be done with it. Because huh? this is all an act. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. You're not going back in the hospital. My They're not taking you back. My purse. Mm -hmm. Your purse is going with you. They're not taking you back in the hospital. My purse. You've been kicked out of two hospitals. Mm -hmm. What do you need your purse for? Mm -hmm. You don't have one in there. We've already went through it. Hey, in your purse. I'll find it in there. Right. The medicine portion of your inhaler is missing from the plastic piece. You don't have an inhaler. All right. Okay, so listen, this is going to be your option. You're going to get up and you're going to sit here, or I'm going to stuff you in the floor. So which one do you want it to be? I'm leaving it up to you. You either get your butt up here, or you're going to have your head there and your feet here, and we're going to close the door and you're going to drive to jail like that. My butt is Oh my God. You can't get Jesus to me. Uh, oh my God, dear Lord. Uh, oh, there's no room. There's no room in there to get it. Well, she was going limp. Oh, yeah, she said, wait, she's not helping you a bit. Well, you're about to get some, you know what's about to happen? You're about to get some more charges. That's what's about to happen. Okay. Sit her. back. Quit coming out. Oh, good. This is fun. Try to get her back that way. <laughs> you can't stuff her in there, Brandon. That ain't gonna work. No, I can't clean it out. Oh. No, I can't. Well, I don't know. So don't touch me. I'm tired. I can't clean it. One more problem. I can't clean it. One more problem. What's in the back, Danny? What? You think we get her in the back easier? Yeah. No. No, no. I don't know if she'll clean the seats and if we'll be able to get her out. And if her breathing stops in there. She's so round. But I'm thinking one of us could back in. One of us could grab lower, one yeah, could grab upper. Once she's in there, I don't, I won't be able to get her out. So I'll have to drag her out. Hey, bud. Is that other portion open with the lock on the other side? No, no, this is it. Yeah. I'm sorry, I thought that would open her no. now, so we could sneak out uh, and no. drag her in. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out. Get her up in here. I could, I could climb. Back over, over. Yeah. Hey, Brandon, come here and look at the back and see what you think. Okay, here's the get up and run off now. <laughs> Good, problem if, solved. If, the, if something happens to her back, then lean back. Listen, you're going to get jammed in a tiny compartment if you don't get up there, man. Listen to me. Listen. Get up there and quit with this bull crap. I can't, acting, I can't and we're going to jam you in a spot smaller. Mm -hmm. We're trying to help you here. Come in the back. Get in there. It's bigger uh, and you're by yourself. You no, have more I'm room. Ready. You're I'm going. Ready. Stop. Okay, Don't put your you hand go. down. Oh, please. I gotta go back. I you gotta go back. Don't you dare f throw yourself oh. on the ground. Oh my God. Oh, Jesus Christ. He's got I'm going to die. It's not going to die. She really can't go to where I want to get her up. Oh, I know. That's the issue. You need to lean back. Every time you sit up. Every time you sit up. 185, I'm 10-6 right now. If there's something major important, I, 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 we've got some issues right now. Well, we can get to both sides at least. I don't know, right? I understand exactly what you're saying. But my problem with me is that I know it's all a hat. You know, no, well, been, we all know yeah, that. That's shit. the problem. But unfortunately, if she goes over and can't breathe, that act's going to turn into a problem. Hey, yeah. wait, hey, hey, hey. Tam is on his way to drop one off. The chargers are lowered to the ground. 
We can throw her in a charger. Yeah, he's going to bring me that mail. He's picking up the beer. Yeah, we can take it. That's why you're going to be a good sergeant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you want to wait. The officers, namely Sergeant Brandon Wardlaw, Officer Adam Barnett, Officer Timothy DeStacio, and Transportation Officer Danny Dugan, were not just unsympathetic. They seemed downright rude and abusive to Lisa. They laughed at her, mocked her, used abusive language, and even pulled her hair. They repeatedly ordered Lisa to get into the police van, but how the hell could she? She couldn't walk, and she told them that. But they just laughed at her and humiliated the poor woman as she fell and lay across the steps of the van with her pants falling down. As far as those on duty were concerned, Lisa Edwards was faking it. When she started struggling to breathe and asked for her inhaler, one of the officers taunted her about cigarettes before eventually finding her inhaler and giving it to her. They called Lisa dead weight because they couldn't lift her into the van. How were four young men unable to lift one older woman into a vehicle? Nurses lift heavy elderly patients into hospital beds every day in America. Two or three female nurses would likely have accomplished this task with ease. But these strong, uniformed individuals fell short. Okay, please give me a stretcher. Put me in the stretcher, Becky. All right. Please give me a stretcher. Please give me a stretcher. No, there's, there's no stretcher for you. Yes, there is. I'm going to I'm sick. I'm going to <laughs> oh my god. I'm going to go back to the report that she originally said. Oh my god. 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 Oh <laughs> What's the matter now? Need your inhaler. Need your inhaler again. All right. Can you can you please use it the correct way this time? Yes. Because you have not used it the correct way. Because I myself have an asthma inhaler, and I know the way that you use it is not the correct way. I got one too. Oh my God. I know. Uh, please help me set it up, sir. Why? Help me set it up. Take your inhaler, up. relax. Take your inhaler, stop breaking yourself up so you spit it all out. You're not, you're not, you're not breathing any of that in, ma'am. Breathe it in. Ma'am, you're not breathing you're, you're any of that inhaler in. Up. You're Please spitting it in. Relax. I can't relax. You guys right. are... Okay. 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 Okay but they never bothered to sit her up. From a face-up, lying-down position in the back seat, Lisa begged for them to sit her up as she continued to complain that she couldn't breathe. She was told to sit herself up, but she was clearly unwell to do so. Lisa continued to plead for help, telling the officers that she was going to die. Nothing seemed to phase them or relay the message that the situation was an emergency. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh. Whoa. 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 We need her on her back. Yeah, get it to her back. Okay. 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 You scratch me. We're going to have some more Okay, Okay, Bill. Okay, Bill. In here. Come on, Brad. Let me get this. Where's your foot? Okay. Can you lean her up and see, Doctor? No, Kevin, no. Come on! You can set yourself up. You better hold his foot up where it's gonna get slammed in the door. His foot's about to get slammed in the door. Oh, please. Oh. Okay. I just throw her shit. My wagon. Did I want the lights all around him? I got some. Hey, them county boys. You better get it together. What is all hers? 
While taking Lisa to jail, Officer Timothy Destacio executed a traffic stop on a vehicle that was driving recklessly on I-640. When he returned to his patrol car, Lisa Edwards had stopped responding. The harsh interactions Lisa Edwards experienced while in the company of those who had an obligation to protect and serve would be the last interactions she would witness before her tragic death. It seems to me like empathy made no appearance that day. Can you imagine going through what Lisa went through? Slowly and painfully slipping away as your cries fall upon deaf ears and mocking tongues. Can you imagine the panic and defeat she must have felt knowing she was dying as careless public servants did nothing to help her? It must have been terrifying. And we didn't like, open it. We open it. Open it. I can't say it like, I can't say it like, open the door. Open the door. We open it. I can't breathe. I can't. I can't breathe. Okay. Okay. I said that. Okay. Huh. 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 Set up. Set me up. Come on, set me up. Please. Come on, set me up. Come on, dog. Oh, my God. I can't say it's me. When the driver of the patrol car finally realized Lisa was completely unresponsive in the back, he radioed in to dispatch who advised him to take her to the same hospital that had just dismissed her. They placed her on life support, but sadly, she died the following day. The autopsy report stated that Lisa died from an ischemic stroke due to atherosclerosis cardiovascular disease. An ischemic stroke is what happens when the blood supply to part of the brain is reduced or interrupted. This prevents brain tissue from getting air and nutrients. When this happens, brain cells start dying in mere minutes. The medical examiner blamed Lisa for her death, claiming that hypertensive cardiovascular disease, morbid obesity, chronic alcohol abuse, acute bronchitis, and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease significantly contributed to her death. But the medical report failed to mention that with acute bronchitis and COPD, Lisa Edwards was unable to breathe while lying down. Some would think that given Lisa's circumstances, this might constitute a positional asphyxiation, resulting in a lack of oxygen to the brain, which could have caused the stroke. But this is mere conjecture and has not been confirmed by medical professionals. Hey, are you up? Yeah, they should be. I don't know, she's not responding back here now. Hey, come on, sit up. Can you advise what for? Uh, female on oh, Did you all get off the Broadway exit? Negative. We're, Negative. We're just, before, just the before the exit. Off the 640. Off the 640. Exit 40. 6. Okay. Sit up. My prisoner. My prisoner. Sit up. Are <laughs> not There's no one that can come to deal with this. No. Yeah. 41, you have an ambulance. Okay. Except for I do. Uh, 62, 
Jim, you being on the 41. Yeah, Dorian. I don't know if she's faking it or what, but she's not answering me. I don't know if she's faking it or what, but she's not answering. Wake up! Hey! Wake up! Wake up! Come on! Lisa Edwards was transported back to the hospital she was kicked out of where she died on February 6, 2023. We all know smoking, obesity, and alcoholism can kill. But honestly, how much alcohol did this woman have access to in a nursing home? And how much exercise can you accomplish when you're confined to a wheelchair and you can't breathe? It's plain to most of us that Lisa tragically died from a lack of compassion. And it's crystal clear to me that medical staff and police officers on the scene just simply didn't do enough to help her. After viewing the shocking video of Lisa's final interactions, August Boylan, who's married to Lisa's son, Tim Boylan, said it was very clear she couldn't use her left side. Her speech got slurred as things progressed. That's one of the first signs you see with a stroke. To me, it's very evident. August is a registered nurse. She added that Lisa had four heart attacks before dying on Monday. August said she died four times and they brought her back four times. Lisa's son, Tim Boylan, told WATE News, if I treated someone the way they treated her, I'd be in jail right now, heading to prison. Why are they not? I have no idea. Fort Sanders Hospital said, the hospital has been in contact with Miss Edwards' family and expressed our sorrow soon after their loss. Well, while that's very Jesus of them, it wasn't Jesus enough to save Lisa's life. The officers involved were placed on administrative leave, but after the case was looked at by the Tennessee Bureau of Investigation, the district attorney general's office said there won't be any criminal charges. Knoxville police say Lisa wasn't handcuffed and no excessive force was used when handling her. Hmm. One of the officers jerked Lisa's head backwards by pulling her hair. What part of that isn't excessive? If I did that to you or you to me, it would be assault. It seems to me like one thing stood between Lisa Edwards and the air she so desperately needed. Lack of interest, concern, or sympathy, also known as indifference. Compassion might have saved Lisa's life. After police officer Chief Paul watched the videos of how his officers treated Lisa, he stated, my expectation is that our officers treat every person they encounter, regardless of the context or situation, with respect, dignity, and basic decency. We should also take pride in helping those who need it. Well, Mr. Officer Two First Names, I saw the video too, in my opinion. I failed to see any elements of respect, dignity, or basic decency. Lisa was denied these things. And now, someone's friend, mother, and grandmother is no longer breathing. So who is at fault? According to the autopsy, Lisa Edwards died from a stroke and natural causes. Because of that, the medical examiner reports that at no time did law enforcement interaction cause or contribute to Miss Edwards' death. But I find that hard to believe. Surely their behavior added to her stress and, through their negligence, they failed to notice she was showing signs of a stroke. They failed to act as adequate first responders. They failed to administer aid. They failed to give Lisa the proper care and comfort she so desperately needed. Would they treat their own grandmothers that way? How would they feel if one of their loved ones was in that wheelchair on the receiving end of this kind of treatment? Are they actually proud of their actions that day? There was nothing admirable about the behavior of those officers. In my opinion, they at least need to be retrained, possibly even fired and stripped of any license they hold to care for people. I mean, look, I get it. 
police have a lot to deal with daily. Their lives are constantly on the line and often on call. They deal with the worst of the worst. It's a very hard job and one that I simply couldn't do. I have a lot of respect for anyone who will don the uniform and stand between me and the bad guys, especially knowing that to go home at the end of a shift is a gift. So kudos to anyone who's willing to sacrifice their time and life for our safety. But this job requires people skills. I believe the officers that dealt with Lisa Edwards that day did not possess these skills. An innocent victim in dire need of medical attention was treated worse than the worst criminal. Surrounded by help, Lisa Edwards suffered alone and was utterly helpless as she slipped out of consciousness with no advocate to stand for her. These people are supposed to protect the helpless. Instead, they mocked Lisa with one officer even stating, it's Sunday and I have better things to do. Nearly 600 generous donors have donated almost $16,000 to the family's memorial fund for Lisa and future attorney fees. Lisa's family retained attorney Devin M. Jacob to file civil suits against both the Knoxville Police Department and Fort Sanders Regional Medical Center. This horrific incident hits home for me. My own mother, Nana Black, who many of you have seen in previous videos, is Lisa Edwards' age. I spend most of my time in another country, so unfortunately, I'm not always able to look out for her. And as much as I try, I'm not always there to be her advocate. Several years ago, my mother was very sick with constant fatigue, which is highly unusual for her. I remember my mom as hyperactive, full of energy, and always busy. When I grew up, I knew that if my mother slowed down, something was wrong. One day, she finally went to the ER with a severe stomach ache, nausea, headache, and persistent fatigue. The emergency room was busy as usual. My mom told the staff she had a history of kidney stones and thought she might have a kidney infection, but they found nothing. They told my mom she was wasting their time and dismissed her despite her arguments. They assumed she just wanted painkillers or narcotics, but that's not my mom, and she knew something wasn't right. But when things got worse, she refused to go back because they treated her like she was worthless and ultimately unworthy of their time. So she stayed home and expected to die. Fortunately, she didn't, but she was very sick for quite a while. Months later, when my mom started having even more issues, she caved in and finally sought the help of a primary care physician. While trying to find the source of her symptoms, she asked him to test her for Lyme disease. He did as she asked and ran the whole tick-based disease panel to see what might come up, hoping to find something that would explain her symptoms. When the results came back, he told her she never had Lyme disease, but he did ask when she contracted Rocky Mountain Spotted Tick Fever. According to the panel results, she definitely had the antibodies. Surprised, my mother told the doc that she'd never had it. He confirmed that she definitely had Rocky Mountain Spotted Tick Fever in the past. He furthered his claim by stating that she would have likely been hospitalized for it, but she hadn't. My mother thought back and recalled the ER visit a year before when the hospital staff had kicked her out for wasting their time. My mom explained to the doc that this must have been what was wrong with her, but the hospital never found the cause of her symptoms. The primary care physician said of course they didn't. They wouldn't have unless my mom had mentioned tick diseases and they'd ran the same panel he did. So just like Lisa Edwards, my mother knew something was wrong. She's an expert on her own body when it comes to knowing when something isn't right. Of course, Nana Black is no medical expert. That's why she went to the hospital to be assessed by them, the professionals. But they didn't listen and they didn't investigate, at least not properly. Like Lisa, there was no one to back my mother up and insist that the professionals do their job and at very least try to find the source of her illness. Many people who contract Rocky Mountain Spotted Tick Fever die without treatment. The treatment is doxycycline and without it, the disease can be fatal. Luckily, it wasn't fatal for my mom. She claims her German stubbornness saved her and that she's just too ornery to die. Now, you may not want to believe these stories, or you may say that the victim's poor health is to blame for the consequences they suffered. Hospital staff couldn't find anything wrong, so nothing was wrong with these two women, right? Wrong. Medical professionals don't always get it right. After all, the profession is called a practice for a reason. Many diseases are not diagnosed or misdiagnosed every day. Just because medical professionals can't find the issue doesn't mean it doesn't exist. 
Let's take a look at a case from 2016. On December 21st of 2016, just two days before Christmas, 57-year-old Barbara Dawson was fighting for her life in a hospital parking lot rather than preparing for Christmas with her family. The events that day played out in a similar fashion to the events leading up to Lisa Edwards' demise. Barbara went to Callahan Liberty Hospital in Blountstown, Florida, complaining of severe stomach pain. Hospital staff checked her out and dismissed her, but Barbara refused to leave. The staff called the police to her room where Officer John Tadlock told her, you can walk out of the hospital peacefully or I can take you out of the hospital. You can oh either my. walk out of here oh. peacefully oh my God. or I can take you out of here. Oh. Police Chief Mark Mallory said she was causing a disturbance in the hospital with her language and the volume of her voice. And you know what? She probably was. You know why? Because Barbara Dawson was dying and desperately using the last minute she had to beg someone to save her. I can't even breathe! Well, come on, Bobby, let's go. Come on. Uh, no, let's study right here. Don't look like you're doing this to me. Ain't nothing I can do. Like come on, let's go. Wait! Come on, let's go. 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 Please put your hands behind your back. Please stop resisting, Miss Dawson. Put your hands behind your back, ma'am. Please. I can't breathe. Put your hands behind your back. I can't breathe. You seem to be breathing okay, right? No, I can't. Please. Please put your hand behind your back. I beg you. You're standing up and you're talking and you're breathing. I need you to please put your hand behind your back, ma'am. Let me go with you. Please put your hand. You have had every opportunity. What language and volume would you use if the shoe was on your foot? If someone had treated her with compassion, she also might have survived. Barbara repeatedly told them that she couldn't breathe, crying, please don't let me die. But the officer went ahead and arrested her for disorderly conduct and trespassing. He then handcuffed her before forcibly removing Barbara from the room. He took her out to the parking lot with the help of nurse Jennifer Waldorf and emergency medical technician Drew Peacock. Barbara continued to cry out that she couldn't breathe and needed her oxygen tank. In the parking lot, while they were trying to load Barbara into the patrol car, she collapsed and fell to the ground. After 20 minutes had passed, they rushed her back into the hospital where Barbara Dawson was declared dead. The medical examiner's office stated that she had died from a blood clot in her lungs due to being excessively overweight. But the real question is, what could have been done to prevent her death? The Mayo Clinic, who had nothing to do with these cases but is a great source for medical information, defines a pulmonary embolism as a blood clot that blocks and stops the flow of blood to an artery in the lung. In most cases, the blood clot starts in a deep vein in the leg and then travels to the lung. Rarely, the clot forms in a vein in another part of the body. A pulmonary embolism can be life-threatening. However, prompt treatment greatly reduces the risk of death. Some symptoms of a pulmonary embolism include shortness of breath, being unable to catch your breath, chest pain, fainting, lightheadedness, dizziness, excessive sweating, and others. Barbara was experiencing some of these symptoms, namely breathing issues, before she collapsed in the parking lot. Anyone can get blood clots, regardless of their weight. Skinny people and healthy people get pulmonary embolisms all the time. Yes, certainly weight can increase your risk. Being overweight is definitely not a healthy thing, and it's true that Barbara Dawson was a hefty woman. But many other factors, including surgery, pregnancy, supplemental estrogen, long plane trips and car rides, all can lead to an embolism. The sad fact is that one third of people who have pulmonary embolism will die without treatment. I think Miss Barbara Dawson proves that point, but she didn't have to be part of the one third. The hospital said, a pulmonary embolism is often immediate and fatal. It is difficult to detect and can be impossible to treat. They also stated that they continue to grieve the loss of a patient and a member of the community. And I'm sure they do now that her demise is a blight on their reputation. But the hospital's reputation didn't appear to matter that much when they were asserting their superior intelligence and waiving their authority by treating this woman the way they did. The family's lawyer, Benjamin Crump, said, there wasn't a dry eye when they listened to the last hour or so of her life. He was referring to the video of Barbara's interactions with the police officer. Much like Lisa Edwards, 
Barbara Dawson was a heavier woman weighing around 270 pounds. When the officer struggled to get her loaded into the back of his patrol car, she fell to the pavement. He believed she was faking her illness and was just being non-compliant. He even mocked her, stating that, falling down like this, laying down, that's not going to stop you from going to jail. Medical staff came out to monitor her vitals while she was on the pavement. They acted as if nothing was wrong with her, even though she was unresponsive. Finally, a doctor went out to check on her. He said Barbara was in a completely different state than she was when he decided to discharge her, so he quickly ordered that she be readmitted. But it was too little, too late, unfortunately, and Barbara Dawson was dead. It's clear to me that the hospital tried to shift the blame and deflect responsibility. They claimed they've dealt with Barbara on several occasions and that she had been ordered off the property before. They claimed she was a difficult patient by demanding to know what medication they were giving her, what it was for, and what procedures they were running. Barbara's aunt, Angela Doner, said, if she don't think something's right, she's going to tell them, and they don't like that. But apparently, at least in this instance, that's exactly what they needed. They didn't recognize a patient in distress until that patient was dead. Doctors and nurses are humans and they make errors too. Asking them questions pertaining to your care is your right as your own advocate. So many medications have similar names but very different purposes. None of us want to be given the wrong medication or have the wrong limb amputated. Asking questions shouldn't be a sin. A law firm from Tallahassee, Parks and Crump, represented the Dawson family in filing a suit against the hospital, plus two of its employees, the city of Blountstown, and the officer involved in the incident back in July of 2016. The Dawson lawsuit claims allegations of false imprisonment, lack of emergency care, battery, and a civil rights violation. Two of the hospital's former employees were fired after the incident. Hospital spokesperson Sandy Poreda said the hospital has made substantial improvements in staff training as well as policies and procedures in an effort to regain the trust of the community since Barbara Dawson's demise. But that's going to be a long road to recovery for them. On July 10th of 2017, Judge Robert Hinkle found that the Blountstown Police Department and Officer Tadlock were not responsible for Barbara's death. But I say again, indifference can kill. Here was a woman in crisis who was both ignored and arrested while she was pleading for her life to be saved. On August 7th, the Dawson family settled with Calhoun Liberty Hospital for $200,000. The judge had previously decided that they could only go forward with a jury trial for denying emergency medical care. The other charges were dismissed. So I guess the settlement meant some form of closure for the family, but I'm sure the loss of their loved one was a much greater cost. At least they didn't have to go to trial. But in any event, I'd say it was never about the money, but rather responsibility, accountability for both actions and inaction. The hospital had to accept their responsibility in the lack of care that contributed to Barbara's demise. Women aren't the only victims when it comes to this kind of indifference. On December 18th of 2022, in Springfield, Illinois, Earl Moore, a 35-year-old alcoholic who was trying to kick the habit cold turkey, was subjected to indifference by EMS personnel. Just like Lisa and Barbara, Earl paid with his life. A call was placed to the Springfield Police Department because Earl was experiencing hallucinations due to alcohol withdrawal. The police officers who responded should be commended on their respectful interaction with a nearly unresponsive Earl Moore. As the body cam footage shows, they were very polite and courteously presented him with common questions in order to better gauge his mental state. They asked him if he wanted to go to the hospital, and as they patiently observed Earl, they never raised their voices. They spoke with him as if he were their brother. It was quite impressive to see their humanity selfly on display, and when they felt certain that he needed medical attention, they called an ambulance. By the time the Lifestar Ambulance Services arrived, Earl seemed like he was on the verge of fully losing consciousness. You know where home is? North 25th. Stay here with me. Well, we're Very gonna well. stay here, but you're not on North 25th. You know who the president is? You know what year it is, bud? Yeah. Let's start with this. You know what uh, your name is? Can you give us that? Earl Tony. Earl Moore. 
Earl, what's your last name? What's going on with you, my man? The two EMS workers, Peggy Finley and Peter Cadigan, treated Earl as if he wasn't worth their time. They insisted that he had to walk out to the ambulance if he wanted to go to the hospital. Peggy Finley yelled at Earl to quit acting stupid and, I'm seriously not in the mood for this dumb shit. Police stood by quietly to assist while Peggy insisted, We ain't carrying you. She and her partner Peter Cadigan didn't carry a stretcher into the house for Earl Moore either. Instead, they left it in the yard. They didn't even attempt to help Earl get outside. The police officers got on each side of the man and basically carried him out themselves while coaxing him to use his legs. But he seemed to have no strength and his legs just kept buckling underneath him. I am not playing with you tonight. Sit up. What is your birthday? What year? Uh, Earl, do you want to go to the hospital, ma'am? We need then we need to get up. You're gonna have to walk because we ain't carrying you. So let's let's get up on your feet. Cause I am seriously not in the mood for this dumb shit. You can walk, come on. Let's stand up. Come on, let's do it, Earl. I know you can do it. I've seen you do it. I swear. No! Stand up. Use your legs. Come on, Earl. We'll get you some help, bud. Let's take the coat with him. Yeah, I got your coat. Come on. Nope, we're not doing that. We're going to the house. The only way we're going to get you is if we walk through the house. Come on, Earl. You're not dead weight. Well, maybe we are. Alright. No, we're just being lazy. Get up! Or you can stay here. If you want to go to the hospital, man, you gotta help us out a little bit. Earl, are you gonna go or are you gonna stay, bud? If you're gonna go, you need to get up and walk. What's up? As Earl kept dipping down, the officers kept gently lifting him back up to his feet. Finally, after several falls, they got him outside, off the porch, and close to the stretcher in the yard. The weak man simply fell across the top of it on his belly. The two EMTs tightly strapped him to the gurney, face down, and loaded him into the ambulance. According to Memorial Health, a patient should never be transported face down. When Peggy Finley radioed the hospital to let them know they're coming, she told them she wasn't going to take Earl Moore's vitals because she didn't want to poke the bear. So his vitals were never monitored in the ambulance. Unfortunately, in that position, face down and tightly confined, Earl couldn't breathe and he died of asphyxia. Hospital staff tried to resuscitate him, but he was officially pronounced dead an hour after arriving. Teresa Haley president of the Springfield branch of the NAACP, said that Earl was shown no compassion whatsoever and that he should be alive today. She is absolutely correct, in my opinion. In a press release, Springfield police said, the officers took steps to assist the patient, to get him the care he needed, even waiting on the scene to ensure the medical personnel loaded the patient into the ambulance. The officers, who are not emergency medical professionals, are not trained nor equipped to provide the necessary medical treatment or to transport patients in this type of situation. Yes, the officers were very professional and courteous. They even performed duties that weren't exactly defined in their job descriptions, but they did so anyway out of respect for this poor man who was simply trying to get his life back on track. That's called humanity. It's the opposite of indifference in many ways. The autopsy report showed that Earl's death was a homicide caused by compressional and positional asphyxia. On January 9th of 2023, state attorney Dan Wright charged Peggy Finley and Peter Cadigan with first-degree murder. The pair were held in jail on $1 million bonds. They faced 20 to 60 years in prison, years of which could have been avoided with just a few minutes of compassion and a moment of consideration for Earl Moore.
Once again, civil rights attorney Ben Crump and his partner Robert C. Hilliard filed a wrongful death lawsuit on behalf of the Moore family. The suit is against both paramedics and their employer, Lifestar Ambulance Services. But the drama doesn't end there. In an effort to save her career and win back her freedom, Peggy Finley wanted police to tell hospital officials that Earl Moore was confused and combative when the ambulance arrived at his home. But of course, police videos show that he was barely able to respond, let alone fight anyone. On January 20th of 2023, Judge Raylene Grishchow ruled that there is probable cause to charge the paramedics with murder. Bail was reduced from $1 million to $100,000, so the pair would only need to come up with $10,000 to be released until the trial. These cases prove just how important it is to have an advocate with you when you go to the hospital. But it's sad to think you may need someone you trust sitting by your side taking notes when you're in the company of those whom you should be able to trust to save your life. This shouldn't be something you have to worry about in times of a medical emergency, but these stories are proof of a cause for concern. Is it likely that medical staff or other public servants will treat you this way? No, of course it's not. Regardless of what the media tells you, most of these professionals are there to help, not hurt. But on the other hand, no one thinks it can happen to them until it's too late. Voice your concerns when you need to do so, but do so with respect. These people are overworked and worn out. When you need them, do your best to be courteous. And if you're part of the medical profession in any way, shape, or form, listen to the people you treat. Have patience with your patients. Their lives and your freedom may depend on it. And always, always, always remember that indifference kills. This was certainly the case for the victims in this story. Rest in peace, Lisa Edwards, Barbara Dawson, and Earl Moore. I'm Mr. Black, and this is the disturbing truth.